Welcome back, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Paula Balboa, Senior Program Manager with the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. It is a delight to be here with you all today. Um, I can speak for myself and uh, my coworkers as well that we're really, really looking forward to uh, hearing about uh, what's going on in each of your states and also um, thinking through how we can facilitate conversation amongst ourselves, experts learning from each other as we uh, learn from you all as well. So the purpose of this first uh, presentation that I'll be heading up is uh, Digital Inclusion Essentials. Um, we want to take this time to level set and define some of the terms that you all will be hearing uh, over the course of the rest of today's session and also tomorrow's session as well. So I know that there are a few people in this room because I see a lot of familiar faces who are already aware of this stuff. For instance, what is digital equity? What is digital inclusion? How do we define the digital divide? But there are folks coming from a variety of different backgrounds who this, may be, this might be new to you. Um, so we want to make sure that we're all using the same terms moving forward. I was having a conversation with someone uh, over lunch and they were, they were saying, you know, like, this work has existed for a long time, but we didn't always refer to it as digital equity or digital inclusion. So how can we use a shared common vocabulary to make sure that we're having a, product, a productive conversation in this room today and tomorrow, but also when we go back home to our communities that we're making sure that we're using the same shared common language to advocate for um, better programs in uh, our communities. So. Uh, agenda for um, this portion of the afternoon. I'll be doing a short intro to who we are as the NDIA um, in case we are new faces for you. We hope that we are friendly faces by the end of tomorrow's session. Um, and then we're going to get into defining um, th those shared terms, that shared vocabulary. We'll get into barriers to accessibility and adoption for digital inclusion programs in our communities. And then we'll talk through some of uh, the solutions. What programs and what strategies um, have worked for communities to address those barriers to digital inclusion to help close that, that, that digital divide? So a little bit about us. Um, we are a community of over 900 affiliates in 48 states. I don't know off the top of my head, and I probably should know which states are missing. Maybe one of my coworkers can assist me, but we're very, very close. Um, I can say, and I think that this may resonate with a lot of folks in this room, that um, that number, 900 affiliates, we were at maybe 200, 300 before the pandemic. So what has the pandemic showed us? It's that access and use of uh, available technology, whether that's broadband or appropriate devices or digital skills classes, has the pandemic made the entire world realize really that those are essential items, not only for folks who are uh, working in this room to improve the, the lives of community members, but also for people like our parents, our neighbors, everyone needs that reliable access and use of devices in order to connect with folks. And the pandemic really made that clear. So we'll be talking through three definitions, again, just to make sure that we're using some shared vocabulary um, uh, throughout today. So this first term, digital equity. I like to think of digital equity as the goal. We want the programs that we create, the strategies that we devise to get the communities that we serve to this place of digital equity. That's where we want them to get. Digital equity defined as a condition in which all individuals and communities have the information technology capacity for full participation in society, democracy, and the economy. What that means in practice is, well, I'm going to bring up COVID again because it's the big elephant in the room. In order for folks in 2020 to, for instance, uh, uh, take, take the census survey that year that had to be suddenly all online. That was also, of course, a presidential election year. If a community member had to register to vote for the first time or perhaps re-register to vote, suddenly that all had to happen online. COVID made it very, very clear that in order to fully participate in society, democracy, and the economy, that digital equity was a, a, a way to get there. So on this slide, I think we've all seen versions of this image before, right? But just to really pin down um, what we're trying to communicate on this slide, we're seeing on the left side, um, equality. And I want you to focus on the books that each of these uh, cute illustrations are standing on. 
each person has three books. In other words, the resources have been evenly distributed to each individual or community member. But we see that the outcome of that is that we're only perhaps only exacerbating uh, existing inequalities. What we want is to take a real assessment of the needs of our community members and to meet them where they are. So on this, in the image on the right, right, there is the same amount of books, but uh, or not the same amount of books, but the, the resources have been more meaningfully uh, and uh, uh, resourced to uh, be community members where they are. So if we talked about digital equity as the goal, the question then becomes, how do we get people there? How do we get community members and households to that framework of digital equity? That's this other uh, definition for digital inclusion. The activities necessary to ensure that all individuals and communities especially the most disadvantaged, uh, which is described in that cover populations um, that you see in your folders and that Amy was describing earlier, uh, have access and use to in information uh, communication technologies. And finally, there's this last phrase for digital divide. Let me just pause here and ask the room, how many of you have heard varying definitions for digital equity, digital inclusion, and digital divide before? <laughs> These are, these are phrases that are used quite frequently in our world, and maybe they aren't always communicating the same thing. So again, we're just trying to pin down this idea that if we're going to use the shared vocabulary, that we're describing the same thing. Most of all, I think, and I wanted to pause on this slide to, to describe that, is that I personally have heard the phrase digital divide um, used in a variety of different contexts over my life in the digital inclusion world over the past 10 years. This has always meant something different, um, and it is through the collective uh, sharing of information and resources that the NDIA community brings together that we can land on definitions like this. So we know that the, the, that the digital divide disproportionately affects those covered populations, right? People of color, indigenous peoples, households with low incomes, uh, people with disabilities, people in rural areas, older adults, the list goes on and on and on. I'm going to come back to this over and over and over again in my short presentation, but COVID-19 has only exacerbated the impacts or the disparities that those covered populations experience. An example of the digital divide is another phrase that um, has found itself into the IIJA, digital redlining. It's now referred to as digital discrimination. An example of the digital divide is a practice in which uh, Internet service providers and deployment maintenance uh, and the upgrade of, it, of infrastructure and delivery of services are disproportionately impacting these same folks, right? People of communities of color, people in rural communities, um, people with disabilities, and older adults. In its 2017 report that the NDIA published, we looked explicitly at the city of Cleveland. And before moving to New York, I lived in the city of Cleveland, so. I can look at this map and say and see that all of the red areas are disproportionately the areas of low income. These are also the black and brown areas of the city. So this is the sort of impact that you know, improper practices uh, by internet service providers can have on a city. It's all the same lines. A joke that my friends and I had when we lived in Cleveland was that we said among ourselves is that we could show this map to anyone who lived in the city of Cleveland and it would be the same map depending no matter what um, uh, category you were looking at, whether it's race, income, age. Um, I think that this issue, as we've seen over the past few years, has really shown itself to be uh, universal across the country. So, what are the barriers to digital inclusion? Now that we've decided, now that we've talked about um, some of the shared vocabulary, I want to, you all to discuss amongst yourselves, or maybe ask yourself this question. If everyone had free access to fast and reliable internet, key phrase, fast and reliable internet, would that solve the digital divide? Who says yes? Raise your hand. Who says no? <laughs> OK, I, th I will just say this is my first time giving this particular version of this presentation, and I thought that this would be like a got you second. But this is a room of very smart people. There's just no, there's no got you section. 
So the answer is no, right? Fast and affordable internet we know is a barrier to uh, closing the digital divide, but there are other components at play. For instance, devices. And to really bear down on that appropriate, I will say appropriate and affordable devices. In 2019, the US Department of Education um, completed a study in which they looked at one category that found itself into the covered populations um, list in the NOFO. This is adults with a disability. The percentage of adults who own a desktop or laptop is 62% um, as of 2019 that the US Department of Education found compared with adults without a disability. So what can we do about this? Or what does this tell us? Well, it, does, it doesn't tell us too much because correlation doesn't lead to causation, et cetera. But it does show us that there is a disparity here. And programs and strategies that we design can help close that gap. Sure, go ahead. So, all right, that's a really interesting like, statistic. But um, when, when you um, break out disability and those without disability, like, what about where they're living and how they're being taken care of, mm -hmm. right? So, what if they're all living independently? That would be a really interesting data point because then you're doing like for like because you're not exactly sure what stage or where people are housed. So, I think that, that would be interesting to dig into the data. Yeah, absolutely, and um, a very good point that what this shows us is, allow me to paraphrase, an incomplete picture, right? And I think that one of the opportunities that all of you in this room have is to gather more, not only more data at all, but more meaningful and impactful data. Data that will tell us something about what the digital divide looks like and what the state of uh, digital equity looks like for the communities that we're all serving. So that's a great point. Along with devices, and of course, fast and affordable internet being a barrier to closing the digital divide, there's also this more, I guess, more nebulous piece, harder to pin down uh, a piece to call it that we're referring to as digital skills. Um, I know that Don's here. I also, I, raise your hand if you're the other person who comes from the public library world. Hello. I also come from the public library world. My background, uh, before coming to NDAA, I was working with the New York Public Library. So you know, lo look to your local public library or your state library as you um, devise your plans. But a public library is an example of a place um, that has been addressing the digital divide for decades now. One of, those, one of the ways that public libraries have been addressing that is by teaching computer classes. This is, I worked in the department at the New York Public Library. It's amazing. We were teaching a variety of classes from teaching grandma how to click with a mouse, which is important and very necessary, all the way up to uh, teaching a, a class, a 10 week class on Python, in which, from my perspective, I had to learn Python suddenly. <laughs> it's really hard. It's not easy, but I was, I was part of this. I was, I was lacking in digital skills. So this is something that we all experience, no matter if we are you know, struggling to click with a mouse, struggling to call our friends or family, or if we're suddenly doing a crash course on a, on a new coding language. Some additional barriers, and these are barriers that um, we in the NDIA community have been hearing a lot, uh, you know, even pre-COVID, but of course a lot more since COVID. Um, more issues that, again, are sort of harder to pin down. And these are, and I would phrase these as community concerns. So what are the reasons that a community member isn't adopting a home internet subscription or that they're not participating in the affordable connectivity program, for instance? The application might be too hard. It might not be available in their own language. They might need help, right? They're missing that human component, that human piece to help them walk through or walk uh, or finish that application. The jargon might be too technical. Uh, my colleague Amy mentioned this in her presentation, but something that we like to do at NDIA is try to avoid using acronyms so much, like describe the program. And I think that uh, that's something that I certainly struggle with. So as a, as a guiding focus for the rest of our workshops today, or today and tomorrow, let's try to be mindful of spelling out the, very, the alphabet soup of programs and uh, strategies that we're talking about. And then, also, of course, there's also privacy and security concerns. So 
to use the, to go back to the example of the affordable connectivity program, an undocumented res, an undocumented resident, for instance, is going to have a universe of reasons that they are hesitant to sign up for that program, paramount for paramount of which is privacy and security. So, how can we address those concerns in a meaningful way? How can we meet community members where they are? The, the solution, surprise, is digital inclusion programming. So this combination of affordable broadband, appropriate devices, and digital literacy trainings. Uh, we sometimes refer to this as the three legs of the digital inclusion stool. So the three legs of the stool. I'm going to break down um, what each of these legs mean and describe. So affordable and low-cost broadband. Let's define broadband. Broadband is the transmission of wide bandwidth data over high-speed internet connection. To go back to my example of COVID, I want to focus on the, on the word bandwidth in this definition. We think about a family of four, for instance, two of which uh, have to get on Zoom calls throughout the entire day. Maybe the other two need to uh, attend online school. Bandwidth was an issue of paramount importance that, again, the COVID-19 pandemic really, really exposed. Right now, we're working, we're existing in this framework where the definition of uh, broadband is defined at speeds of 25 megabits down, three, three megabits upload. That's not enough, right? We know that that's not enough, and we're working to improve what that uh, can mean for a household who is more and more reliant on reliable home broadband. Beyond broadband, we want to ask ourselves in the digital equity space, who's adopting? So an example of this, for instance, is the affordable connectivity program um, or an existing free or low cost offer from an internet service provider, Comcast Internet Essentials, for instance, AT&T Access. So these are programs that are designed to get those covered populations or get populations in the most need signed up for a home internet subscription to help close that digital divide. NDIA has several resources uh, that we maintain um, on our website, one of which is the free and low cost uh, internet plans page. This effectively is a list of each um, discount internet subsidy or uh, subscription subsidy that's provided by uh, uh, internet service providers, along with a list of eligibility requirements, how much that plan is, um, et cetera. And of course, there's a link here to the FCC's ACP page, Affordable Connectivity Program page. Another solution uh, after um, free and affordable, or low cost of affordable broadband is appropriate and affordable devices. So devices rule our world today. There is a number of ways that we all access and use the internet. Um, the key term here is appropriate devices. So thinking through the common types of devices that we use every day, also the common types of devices that are collected by uh, data authorities like the, um, like the American Community Survey, smartphones, tablets, laptops, all of these devices, as we know, have different uses and different strengths and weaknesses. We know that a lot of the communities that we're serving or that we're seeking to serve are smartphone reliant. There is a relationship between uh, income level and having a smartphone as being like the primary way in which a household accesses and uses the internet. When trying to access and use the internet, if a, if a household that has a lower income is, for instance, trying to apply for a job application or when they're trying to complete a resume or anything else, that it becomes so much more harder on a smartphone than it needs to be. Imagining what that process looks like on a laptop, for example, is way, way different. Not to mention the fact that, some, that a lot of websites aren't outfitted for smartphone uh, devices. So filling out a form, for example, well, is going to look way different uh, depending on what device you're using. An example, um, and Jeremy described uh, a, a program of device uh, distribution and refurbishing um, in his remarks. But another example is uh, from an organization in our uh, network called Computer Reach. They're based out of Pittsburgh. Um, they have worked in this space for the past 15 years. I would say that they are one of the leaders in uh, computer device and device refurbishing and reuse. Effectively, they take in devices through a variety of means, whether it be corporate donations, 
or uh, donations from the community. And not only do they offer devices to communities in need, prioritizing communities in need, but they also uh, provide computer literacy training, tech support. So it's not just giving someone a laptop and then saying, see you later. Because we know that's not enough. What if they don't know how to use that? So Computer Reach also provides that uh, support for community members who are receiving um, those devices. We have a variety of resources that are related to devices. Uh, specifically, it's a chapter in a resource called the uh, Digital Inclusion Startup Manual that got a revision in 2020 um, as a result of COVID. Specifically, the chapter um, in this resource is called what is, a what is a Community Digital Inclusion Program? So recommend, uh, recommended reading uh, as a follow-up to this workshop. Finally, the last solution is digital skills training. So we have foundational digital skills, right? So I can turn on a device. I, can, I know how to use and access the internet. I know how to open up Google Chrome or Internet Explorer or what have you and find the information that I need. These are foundational digital skills. This goes back to what I was doing not too long ago and teaching grandma how to click with a mouse at, at the public library. But beyond this, there are other digital skills that are more and more necessary as workforce moves online. So thinking through what it's like to apply for a job, that doesn't happen. There are no more paper applications that are mailed in anymore, even if the job is you know, working as a, I think they're called sandwich artists at Subway, right? That job still needs to, that job application still needs to be completed online. So how can we improve the access and use of digital devices for communities and community members who are in the most need? An example of this comes from the public library. Uh, the Tech League is the Salt Lake City Public Library's version of um, their digital skills, digital training uh, program and curriculum. As a recommendation, I just and I, this has been repeated already several times in this workshop, we would highly, highly recommend that you include your local public library in the plans that you are creating and devising. They have been doing this work. They already, they know the answers. They need your support. So just plug for, for, plug for my public library people. Uh, we maintain, um, in, the, in the previous resource that I mentioned, the Digital Inclusion Startup Manual, there is a chapter that is specifically about digital skills. The revision that that chapter got in 2020 was how to deliver digital skills programs when everyone has to be remote. So we included resources for um, logging onto Zoom, that were based off of some existing best practices in the community. This is a small, small list of the universe of free uh, resources that are available online. These are just highlighting uh, just a few. An example of a program that brings together those three solutions, again, affordable internet access, appropriate devices, digital skills training is a program called Digital Navigators. Digital Navigators is, again, it's the type of program that has existed in some way ever since a place like a public library or a computer lab and a housing authority has had public computers and staffing there and a the staff there to assist community members get to the resource that they need. In 2020, in COVID, we were talking with our community members and we were asking everyone, you all have to deliver these digital skills classes online. No one can come back in person for some amount of time. So we asked our community, what is working and what's not working? What are the barriers to access for a community member to, for instance, log onto a Zoom call? What issues are you having? As a result of those conversations, we designed, created, and developed a program that's called Digital Navigators. Digital Navigators are individuals that address the entire digital inclusion process. So it's a program that wraps in all three of those solutions devices, connectivity, skills, with community members. And they will say that the key element of digital navigators, what makes digital, nav digital navigators work, is that digital navigators come from the community that they're serving. So to address that gap in trust, if there's privacy concerns, um, if there's a lack of information, a digital navigator is usually coming from the housing authority, for coming from the building if, if it's a program that um, is run by a housing authority. They're, coming, they're, a, they're a resident of that building. 
In the case of a public library, they are already librarians or they are, re they are existing staff of the library. So they already are working with community members. They're that familiar face that an individual sees all the time and now they have this role and an understanding of what the digital inclusion you know, ecosystem looks like. They have knowledge of ACP re resources. That's part of the training that a digital navigator undergoes in order to provide better services for their community members. So again, a plug of resources that are available on the NDIA webpage. Um, these five or so bullet points are templates of, uh, of, of documents that a, that a digital navigator uses in their day-to-day. -day. So a skills assessment, again, in order for a digital navigator to figure out what the needs are of their community member how comfortable they are with technology that's been formalized into a document called a skills assessment. There's also a follow-up survey. And for anyone who um, is interested in getting a digital navigator program off the ground, which I would plug would be a really great idea as a result of these plans, um, the, a template of the digital navigator job description um, is available online as well. Um, NDIA is supporting a national digital navigator core. So as this digital navigator program continues to evolve as well, it should evolve as uh, the needs of communities um, continue to change. We are launching or we have launched a national program that is specifically focused on rural and tribal communities. So as we continue to learn um, from this project, we will continue to update these resources that are available on our page for folks in this room. So if Digital Navigators is an example of a specific type of program that uh, can address the needs of community members, what's an example of a strategy to address the needs of community members? This is uh, the idea of digital inclusion coalitions. A digital inclusion ecosystem is a combination of these programs, these policies, the collective will of folks um, and organizations to address these needs, to coordinate a variety of entities and for as we start to think about the requirements in the Digital Equity Act, this, this will start, I think, to get at what uh, we're going to be describing for the rest of uh, today and tomorrow. But it's coordinating entities across, in this case, a state or in a community um, to address all aspects of the digital divide. All of those aspects, again, being affordable devices, affordable internet, and digital skills. Coalitions are were a little more sparse before the pandemic and they have really, really blossomed um, since 2020 as um, organizations and, and convening entities have realized that there are a lot of levers to pull when addressing the digital divide. There's a variety of organizations that are all working towards the, um, helping the needs of their community members. So we see this idea of statewide and also local coalitions um, really taking shape over the past two years, and it will continue to do so um, as a result of state, state digital equity planning. There's a variety of roles that coalitions play. Um, the advocacy effect I like to think of as changing the opinion of, uh, of a given community or service area. So whether that's through media um, or the words that we say to our community members, right? We're trying to change the opinions or introduce new concepts like definitions for digital equity, digital inclusion, and, di and the digital divide to the communities that we serve. It's also the alignment effect. A lot of organizations are, that, are, that are working in digital inclusion think that they're working in a silo. At NDIA, we hear this over and over and over again. That's one of the reasons that our organization exists, because to, to bring together uh, practitioners and um, organizations working in digital inclusion to get folks to talk with each other. So another outcome of a coalition forming is uh, this alignment effect. People meeting each other and realizing that they can work towards a collective goal, especially when resources uh, until very recently have been so limited. And finally, there's the network effect, which is this idea of long-term strategy and planning. How can we make it so that if and that when state digital equity planning money runs out, that all of these programs don't just disappear and go away? This is the sort of work that should, have, that should be happening regardless of the fact of uh, the biggest uh, investment by the federal government in, in digital equity 
in our lifetime. So how can we make sure that these programs continue um, after our planning, after our work is done? An example of who is involved in coalitions. Um, in the intros, I heard the phrase stakeholder engagement thrown out quite a few times. So just an example uh, from a poll that NDA took of our community of the types of organizations to engage with who is working digital equity. Nonprofits are leading the way. Nonprofits being broken down into, you know, any type of organization that is offering uh, digital inclusions or, or social services to their community. To give you an idea of the structure of a coalition, we're breaking this down into uh, the focus, collective, action, guide, and support. The focus you can think of as the audience that a given digital inclusion coalition is trying to serve. That audience can be very, very varied, and it can be quite wide, and that's on purpose, right? We're trying to solve for a variety of issues. The collective then is who's in the room? Who are the organizations, who are the stakeholders that are working towards uh, closing the digital, divide, the, the digital divide for community members? The task force then is who are the experts in each of those coalitions who can work together to come up with solutions, programs, strategies for their, for their community members. Of course, there should be a guiding team and a, and a backbone of uh, organizations working together um, to, address the, uh, to address these needs. This is just a quick example of a coalition structure. You can find more in a, another resource that NDIA maintains online. Um, the Coalition Guidebook uh, just got a refresher this year. So along with finding awesome and informative graphics like this, you can also find more information about who, which coalitions uh, exist near you geographically. Contact information, if you need to talk with each other, NDIA is happy to facilitate those conversations. Again, we learn as much from you as you learn, hopefully, from uh, workshops like this. So we are happy to, to get folks talking with each other. This is a resource that's available online. Um, and like everything that we create, it's free. So I uh, encourage you uh, to check that out. I would be remiss if I didn't include at the end of my presentation a plug for how to join our community. Our community, again, being folks who uh, talk with each other, uh, learn from each other in, a, in virtual spaces and, of course, in physical spaces like this. Um, so digitalinclusion.org slash join uh, is how you can get connected with us. And finally, uh, next February, next March, yeah, February to March, uh, we will be having our annual net inclusion conference in San Antonio. For folks who are wondering what exactly happens here, it's this, but like 100 times bigger. It's over the course of three days, and it'll will be in San Antonio in February. Like that sounds like a nice place to be, especially if you're escaping the winter northeast doldrums in the northeast. So uh, please join us. And I think that is it for me. Thanks. Happy to answer any questions as well. Sure. Yeah. So just to rephrase for anyone who didn't hear, is there any, what is the benefit of having a statewide coalition? Um, in New, I'll use New York State as the example. Um, coalitions have been regional until the, until the state digital equity planning process. For instance, there's been the Western New York coalition. There's been the Finger Lakes coalition. Again, even though these are robust coalitions that are led by very, very intelligent people, they weren't always talking with each other, or at least talking with each other as much as they should have. So the benefit of a statewide coalition is not only to you know, get folks talking with each other, but also to share the collective workload. Um, this work doesn't happen in a bubble, nor and people shouldn't feel siloed, but from our perspective, from the national perspective, the Feeling of feeling siloed is something that we hear over and over and over again. So a statewide coalition can help address um, these, the needs of, commu of uh, communities that sometimes feel like they're working alone.
Well, if I may add, I think also when it comes to coalitions, it's important to know that sometimes the local coalition, the regional coalition, the state coalition, they play different roles, right? So juju inclusion, really the work, right? Like juju equity is the goal, juju inclusion is the work. It happens at the local level. So like the local coalition, so if you are trying, we're going to talk more about it, to reach out to the community, engaging with the local coalition might be a more, you know, more productive use of your time in, than engaging with the statewide coalition. So you know, it really depends, but the local coalitions have those organizations that's close to the ground, close to the people, close to the program, like the front lines. And what I have been learning, you know, traveling and learning in, in, um, in DIA is that the, the regional and state coalitions tend to be more, more, you know, top heavy, right? Let's talk about strategies. Let's share resources. What's going on? How can we align better in this way? So, you know, so keep that in mind that each coalition really is, is different. And, and sometimes the regional area that they look to serve um, can determine the level, I guess, how can you can leverage them for, to um, develop the plan. I just like to add on to that. You know, I, I think that the statewide coalitions do can can be really effective, um, but they're only as good as they are if they include the coalitions at the local and community level. And so, for instance, for New York, I know that because we were uh, managing a grant for the New York Digital Inclusion Fund, and so we had ten coalitions that we worked with in New York State. And so those coalitions actually are all part of the statewide New York coalition. And so and so I feel comfortable saying that, you know, in New York I'd be like, okay, well, yes, you should connect with the state coalition because they are full of representation of coalitions at the lo from the local and the community level. Now, if your state like my state in Washington, there's just the Seattle King County area that has a local. So if you were to look at that map again, you'd see a statewide coalition but just one little dot for a local coalition. You know, and so I'm like, OK, well, how can I then work with my state to help them kind of observe or at least to make sure that they're inclusive if there are others, if there are other coalition efforts happening? And so um, and and by the way, when I talk to coalitions, I'm telling them to contact theirs to work with their state to, if they have a digital equity plan to share that with their state, because as, they're, as you guys are doing these plans, it's important for you to know about those as well. You know, so um, if they do reach out to you, you know, that's us sometimes. <laughs> cool. I think my coworker, Mooney Ray, is going to take us away on meaningful community engagement. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> not yet. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So I, I just want to share for a statewide coalition in Connecticut for a small state, it works very well. We have that. We have a nice balance of local representation, but we also have a direct pipeline to the governor's office um, because we have our, our main core team, myself, um, the con uh, Connecticut Education Commissioner, Office of Policy Management, and the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. And we do, um, you know, everything. They're informing us. We're informing them. It's a really nice balance of um, informing our, um, our, our users, our, our, everyone who's engaged, but also we have that direct line to um, the decision makers. So in, in a small state, the statewide coalition works very well.